Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christos Ioannou. Uh, before I present the last plenary talk, let me say a massive thank you to the organizers for this beautiful From All Aspects event they put together. Um, we all share a common passion towards economics, but our passion towards the messengers of economics is even greater, uh, judging from the response we saw recently to the GoFundMe request. And this is even more pronounced uh, when you consider that there were a lot of contributions, a lot of hefty contributions from fellow economists who did not even know Miltos, uh, which is simply overwhelming. Um, wish you Miltos and all the Miltos in the world uh, a speedy recovery. I hope soon we will bring this beast uh, down. Um, as far as the logistics, uh, if you have a question, please send it to me by private chat. Uh, and the speaker in the last five minutes will answer the questions, or rather as many questions uh, as possible, given the time constraint. Without further ado, it is with great pleasure that I present the last plenary speaker of the conference, a great and creative researcher by any measure, uh, Kostas Arkolagis. Uh, Kostas is the editor of the Journal of International Economics with many important contributions, especially in spatial economics. He has published extensively in the top five. I pass the floor to my very good friend, Kostas Arkolagis. Thanks, Christo. It's an honor to be here and a great pleasure to, uh, to see you. And I wanna, before I start, I wanna wish also again, uh, speedy recovery to Miltos. I'm sure things will be, uh, you know, he's a big fighter, so things will be great very soon. Um, and again, thanks for the organizer for the honor. Uh, so this uh, this paper is joined with uh, uh, Federico Neus and Yuhemi Yauchi, and it's on production networks in space. So a key feature of the modern economy is the geographic complexity of production networks. And these networks are fragmented among, among many dimensions, countries, regions, and firms. Um, and uh, the one a uh, common terminology many of you have heard about um, discussion production networks uh, across the world is the, the term global value chain. And from uh, very recently, uh, uh, more and more recently, people have been talking for how crucial they are for the economic success of countries. Uh, but the literature analyzing networks um, across countries and across space um, have been basically fragmented in uh, two dimensions. There are, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of work in macroeconomics that deals with uh, uh, production networks in space uh, that are dealt dealt with exogenously, so they are fixed over time. They are fixed across policies, and there's a big literature that treats uh, uh, treats networks endogenously, but uh, only analyze the micro implications and not the macro implications. Um, so there's kind of a limited understanding of what happens basically when. Uh, endogenous formation of the networks as a result of policies uh, result to, uh, to macroeconomic changes and what are their implications. And that's what uh, the effort will be today to kind of unify these two approaches and analyze uh, and uh, endogenous uh, network formation space with micro foundations uh, in space. Um, so, um, we will, to do that, we will combine theory and empirics, um, and uh, we will try to answer two, these two key questions. How do production networks endogenously arise across countries or regions? And how do macroeconomic shocks, meaning policies, uh, endogenously shape these networks, and what are the aggregate implications? So we'll go from the policy to the micro implications aggregating to the endogenous networks and macro implications. Um, so we will start by building a micro model of spatial production networks. And where space here will be motivated by our data set um, on Chilean firms will be municipalities in Chile and countries. And the firms will do two things in our model. We'll search for consumers and we'll match with other firms to provide intermediate inputs. So they will buy intermediate inputs and they will sell intermediate inputs to other firms. And uh, this will be like the component of search and matching and the endogenous formation of networks. Um, this model will show it has a very tractable uh, aggregation. In particular, we can solve for like all the key objects that are in the, uh, are spatial economists and macroeconomists are, are interested about, uh, of. For example, um, gravity equations, as we call them, of flows from every location to another location, both at the extensive margin, how many relationships there are, and at the intensive margin. 
We'll solve for positive properties of the equilibrium, so we can uh, characterize uniqueness, can deal with sufficient statistics uh, for the uh, for green counterfactuals and for welfare gains. And we will also analyze the normative properties of the system, meaning how this and the role, what is the role of endogenous formation of space for the implications of our macroeconomic policies. And then to kind of speak to the data, we will apply this model to uh, rich administrative data from Chile. These are basically the universe of uh, formal transactions in Chile. Uh, every time that you issue and receive in Chile, this goes to the central bank administration, uh, it gets registered and it will tell you what firm did it sell to which other firm. Uh, and um, um, we will use this data to look at the connections of firms across space in Chile. And we will estimate the role of sets and matching fictions in shaping the spatial production networks, of course, using our model. And then we, using the calibrated model, we will study the macro and the factual um, and then look at the endogenous network, how the endogenous network leads to key amplification effects. So we will find that um, as a result of, impact on international, of the impact of international trade shocks and domestic transportation infrastructure, the endogenous network formation amplifies the, uh, the microeconomic implications of what was previously thought um, uh, in international trade and spatial economics in, in, with models with exogenous networks. Uh, so we relate to a big literature um, uh, that is uh, active in both trade and macro and spatial economics. Uh, but one feature and one nice feature of our approach is that we can, because it's so tractable, we can use all these tools that have been um, uh, developed in, in spatial economics the past few years to analyze the positive and the normative properties of the spatial uh, networks. While pre pre uh, previously these things were um, largely infeasible because of the uh, non-tractability of the endogenous formation. So I'm gonna, without further ado, I'm gonna um, talk about the, I'm gonna go to the Chilean data and I'm gonna talk about the main motivated facts. I'm going to be a little bit uh, fast given the to the interest of time. Um, uh, so, but I will present uh, the facts that are based on this uh, new data set that um, our co-author Federico Cunos is building in Chile with uh, with the rest of the team in the central bank. This is the internal revenue service uh, data for value added tax collection purposes. So every time you issue a receipt, basically, they cover the universe of domestic trade between all firms. Um, this is during 2015, 2019, but we actually extend the database uh, like year, every day. There's more data, and we also, uh, actually, yeah, we for different aspects of the data, we have data before that too. So this will include information about the seller and buyer firm identities, uh, the date of the transaction, the total amounts, and the origin destination. And we can actually geocode that to the 345 municipalities in Chile. So you see with where each firm is sending, is, is originating and where is it sending its product. Um, and then uh, com we combine this data set with um, custom data that will tell us information about imports and exports, um, firm balance sheet data that will tell us total sales and much employer employee data uh, that will tell us information about employment and wages at the municipality level. So three are the facts, um, and I'm going to go uh, quickly over the second, but I'm going to focus on the first and the third. Uh, so the first one says uh, the number of domestic suppliers and buyers is correlated with firm geographic location. This is like the population density of the location of the firm is and firm size. So first fact basically will indicate that there is some uh, returns to scale in a, or some characteristic of geography that affect the, the firm performance and the firm, uh, the firm network, the firm formation network, network formation, and that the firm size, size itself also determines how much the firms um, kind of uh, engage into uh, search and matching, as it will be in our model. The second, just, ex the second fact explains um, how, the, the, how the relationships of, of uh, the supplier buyer relationships relate to distance and the nuts the, in a nutshell here the result is that there is a strong relationship between both the extensive marginal relationship and the intensive margin and distance a declining relationship so there is less uh, there is a much fewer relationship further away than there are nearby and finally what we find in the data is that there is a response of the network 
uh, two macroeconomic shocks from abroad. So this is kind of from the interest of say, of, of uh, to, if you want to think about the importance of global value chain, what we do is look at looking measure macroeconomic uh, shocks that arrive to Chile because of uh, uh, global macro shocks, and then we see how they reflect on the domestic network of Chile. And that's uh, that's kind of one fact that will lead our calibration. Um, the fact one and two will lead kind of the model our, our model selection basically. Um, so this is the, the first fact um, uh, here is that, that the population density um, is systematically related to the average number of links that the firms have, both buyers, how many buyers the firm has, and how many suppliers does it have. So in other words, if you're in a more dense in a more dense region, you have on average more suppliers than a firm that is in a less in, in dense region, and, and, and the same for buyers. Uh, we also see, so this is how important geography is for the uh, sets and matching. In the second fact, we see how much uh, buyers and suppliers, it's customers and buyers, how they, they increase with the firm size. So what we see is that firms that are bigger on average have both more suppliers and more buyers again. So they, the, the firm size is an important characteristic uh, for firm performance here. And that's kind of a key ingredient in the sense of modeling micro, micro, microeconomics in our model, right? So you want to model at the firm level the behavior of the more productive firms that will engage in more relationships and they will have more buyers. Um, so I'm going to skip the second fact in the interest of time, but I told you in that cell, more less relationships when we are further away, when two firms are further away. And the last fact is about uh, how uh, import shocks um, affect um, affect the, um, the performance of the firm, in particular, how many suppliers and buyers that they have. So I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to explain two of the numbers here. We're using what is called um, a shift share design. We basically measure macroeconomic shocks in terms of um, the growth of, uh, of the, the growth of exports of a country in a certain product, let's say steel. So like say that China is becoming exports in steel grow very fast. And then we see the share of steel that a certain firm, firm I, is using okay, uh, uh, from China. So if you see that China is growing, steel, steel sector is growing a lot, this means that this indicates that China has become much more productive. And if you were exposed to steel because you were importing a lot of Chinese steel before, that's going to be likely a positive shock for the firm. And uh, indeed, what we see is that the firms, on average, firms that are more exposed to these positive import shocks um, increase their domestic suppliers and on average um, have buy more from them. Uh, so it's as if like, they become more productive more, uh, because they are more efficient uh, in terms of uh, buying cheaper Chinese steel or more productive Chinese steel. And that allows them to expand their domestic networks of suppliers. And also, they also expand their sales. And this is something that intuitively should hold if you feel like the firm is indeed exposed to positive from software abroad through this global value chain. And we will use it to calibrate the model. We will, on average, our model will kind of deliver this implication that uh, firms that are kind of in regions that are more exposed to positive shocks from abroad will expand more rapidly um, their number of suppliers and their sales. Okay, so guided by these facts, now we're going to present the model. Uh, which is kind of a, a model of firms uh, networking in space. And the space here is partitioned by a finite, um, finite number of locations. Um, so you can call them I, U, or D. And this location could be domestic, but they could also be uh, abroad. So it could be like a municipality in Chile trading with the United States or trading with Cyprus and so on. And there's a continuum of work on measure LI in its location and W is the wages. So these are just notation. We have cost elasticity substitution preferences. And there are two types of goods. So when I'm trading, I'm either selling to final consumers in my own municipality, or uh, I, I sell to a firm, my, a good that will become the firm's intermediate input um, and, uh, in another municipality or in my own municipality or, in, in, or abroad, of course. And I have to pay a, a cost, tau UD, that is like a cost um, is basically an efficiency loss for shipping the good to another location. 
Um, and as I said before, final goods to consumers are only locally traded. So what do the firms do? The firms reach consumers and they also buy and supply in the immediate inputs with other firms with which they match. So there's a certain matching with other firms to kind of uh, become buyers and suppliers of the intermediate inputs and uh, in a procedure that we'll describe uh, right uh, next. And the firm have different productivity disease drawn from an uh, arbitrary distribution. Um, so the critical bit here is that we need to characterize the unit cost of production by a firm uh, omega in some location I. Okay, so this is how costly is to produce one unit of your product. And the idea here is that the firm has some productivity, Z, um, but it also is, a, is producing using foreign intermediates, sorry, uh, intermediates from all other possible firms that we will match with uh, at the rate, at the share one minus beta and labor, local labor at the share beta. Now, what is key in this model is that the share of firms that you match with is endogenous. And this is the endogenous set omega of omega of firm small omega. Okay, so this is the firms that you will create this uh, matching linkage and they have, you have to pay a cost to be able to match with them. Um, and this, uh, of course, are the, the associated price for the intermediate input that you, um, that you buy. And how does uh, search and matching happen? You pay a cost to search and once you search, then some matching probability to match with different firms from different locations. And that will have, then we'll have the standard matching, search and matching technology of diamond, the matching technology of diamond mortars and disarrages. Um, so just kind of in a nutshell to explain how things uh, work now in terms of the search and matching, the firms basically post advertisements for suppliers and buyers across locations. Uh, so this is kind of related to some earlier work I had on uh, firm searching and uh, more recent work of the Mir, Phil, and Xu and Yang for search and matching. And once they pay this uh, cost, there is a search, there is a search intensity and the final search outcome would depend on some random matching by location a la Diamond, Morsens, and Pisaridis. So how many uh, suppliers do you match with depends on your supplier intensity and this matching probability, which is exogenous to the firm but it depends on how much um, searching matching happens in the country. And the same for buyers, but uh, you have to pay a different uh, cost for that. And there's a different intensity for that. So um, each, uh, each firm Z in location I basically um, makes this effort of uh, finding buyers and finding suppliers and, uh, and then depending on uh, this kind of aggregate matching, uh, matching uh, diamond mortis and pisaridis kind of matching technology that gives you the final number of suppliers and buyers that you have uh, with other locations and of course with your own location. And you can only sell to, your, to people in your own country, in your own municipality, sorry. And the final bit is that the firm will charge the price and because of the continuum of firms, they will just charge a constant markup as it's typical in this uh, CS models. There's a profit per consumer that is just a constant markup over the sales to local consumers for final consumption. And the total profits of a firm, and this is a mouthful, but this is probably the most uh, challenging part of the model, and then the rest uh, just follows from these personal conditions, is this is the net profit of, of the consumers. This, Profit per consumer times how many consumers you search. And this is your profit from the buyers. So this is how many, um, how many buyers you find for your own product times an aggregate matching efficiency from location I to location D. And the C, the cost is now determined by uh, the cost function I mentioned before. So this will be determined by how many suppliers do you try to reach times the matching technology of suppliers times the cost of the supplier from location U selling to location I. Uh, and these are just the costs of um, uh, searching for each one of these activities, finding uh, consumers, finding buyers, and finding suppliers, okay? Um, yeah, so all these three margins of, of uh, selling and buying uh, for consumers, 
for finding buyers for your intermediate input and find for suppliers that will make you potentially cheaper um, will uh, kind of give you some firm optimal problem of determining your network, uh, your firm network across all locations, your location I and all the other locations that, uh, that you sell, you find buyers and all the other locations that you find suppliers. The solution of this problem is actually turns out to be very simple, owing to the fact that we have like CS demand and so on. But um, what happens here is that the number of suppliers that the firm from uh, location I finds in location U, a firm of type Z, a firm of productivity Z, depends on this AUI, which is a, a function of the cost of shipping that I mentioned, uh, so, so there's a function of this uh, fixed cost of uh, searching that I mentioned before here, this ones, so this ones, right? And uh, other parameters, but also endogenous variables and the matching, the matching probabilities. Um, so the way to think about this is that geography here plays a role. So if geographic conditions are more uh, are, are better, then you will have a better network, production network, and potentially more suppliers, for example, with location U. Well, maybe less with location U prime that is far away. But also your total number of suppliers doesn't depend only on geography, but also depends on your productivity. So more productive firms here will have a bigger network. Also, I showed you in uh, fact one. Similarly, we have for uh, the number of buyers of the firm or the, 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 the buyer intensity of the firm and uh, the number of consumers. Uh, so based on fact one, we get both, in the model, we get both the fact that geography matters, but also the fact that firm uh, identity, firm size matters. The final bit of the model is to close the model using by computing these matching probabilities uh, that I mentioned. And the way we do it here is that we assume that the matching probability between location U and location D for suppliers and for buyers depends on uh, how many uh, how many firms. Uh, so this is the, the total number of firms that uh, are searching for supplier relationships, and it's the total number of firms uh, that engage in um, buyer relationships. Uh, and these are the basic the aggregate intensities for suppliers and buyers. And depending on, uh, on how many firms search, um, and the total number of firms search, and then this aggregate efficiency of searching that is also determined by this exogenous parameter, then you have a, like a ratio uh, of the firm that actually successfully uh, uh, end up having um, uh, supplier and buyer matching, successful buyer, uh, supplier and buyer relationships. Okay, so this multiplied by the n the intensity of searching will give you the final number of, um, of suppliers that you have for a given firm and similarly correspondingly uh, for the uh, buyer firms. Now, now, having kind of dealt with microeconomics of the model, now we go to the macro. And the macro part requires that you solve for the number of firms, the total number of firms, that sell from location U to location D and their average sales from location U to location D. And the trick here is that when you do, you know, like, of course, there's some um, kind of work there to create the final output, but it's basically some integrations and so on. And the nice thing that you're getting is that uh, this, um, the number of, of firms that engage in successful relationships, the extensive margin, and the transaction per volume, the intensive margin, have this celebrated gravity form that people in spatial economics use. So all the endogenous variables are basically encapsulated in this origin and destination terms. So this zeta and this xi have, um, is a mix of endogenous variables at the origin and at the destination. And, uh, and then the bilateral terms uh, that kind of incorporate all the information of how much, uh, how much, say, for example, distance costs and fixed costs of trade and so on affect, it, uh, affect the supplier and buyer relationships are all uh, in this term, uh, he, the chi. So the term chi here 
for example, the extensive margin in, in includes not only the iceberg cost, the cost of um, uh, the extra, the cost of shipping the good, but also the fixed cost of uh, matching both with the buyers and suppliers. And altogether, this creates a bilateral friction of creating an extensive margin or relationship between every any two locations. Of course, this is aggregated across, across all the firms that engage in the relationship between location U and location D. And vice versa for the intensive margin, except that the, then the bilateral resistance term only includes uh, the trade costs. And because of course, that's what matters at the intensive margin. And with the elasticity of one minus sigma, we see elastic substitution uh, among groups. Now, one thing, so one thing here is that distance potentially will have different effects on the, on the intensive and the extensive margin, exactly because the fixed cost and the iceberg cost will matter different for this kind of, um, for the extensive margin here and for the, for the intensive margin here. Okay, so this is kind of the intuition of how we get this fact too, where we find that distance matters for the relationship, but indeed we find that the extensive margin is much more responsive than the intensive margin. Um, uh, in terms of, so, so the, the extensive margin is much more responsive to distance than the intensive margin. Okay, so let me just kind of go to the uh, general room. I have like um, 15 minutes of questions, right? Are there questions or? Yes, so the last five minutes is for questions. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so I'm gonna <clears throat> now talk about how do we put this into general equilibrium? So basically the interaction representation is I'm only very some facts of how to build a model with geography and firm size. I told you how the firms, more productive firms engage in more relationships, but this also depends on their geographic location. And um, I showed you kind of this um, aggregation at the regional level or at the bilateral regional level, these gravity equations. And now I'm going to talk about general equilibrium. Um, so in general equilibrium, basically, well, everything that was before exogenous, like we took it as exogenous, like the wages and the, the number of relationships will become something, an object that we have to solve for. So the search intensity um, uh, kind of parameters, not parameters, but variables that you saw before that were determining um, the N, the search intensity of the firm, the total number of firms that engage in relations between any two locations, um, the number of firms that enter, um, of course, the, the wages will be determined by accordingly by equilibrium conditions of the model. I'm not gonna go into details because this is kind of a lot of technicalities, but there is basically an adding up constraint. Your total sales have to include your segment to all the other locations in the, in the world and so on and so forth, uh, which with corresponding accounting relationships. And, uh, and then we also solve for things like a, a, a cost shifter. For example, this CU star that would be a crucial object here is the average cost that um, the intermediate inputs from a location U will have, okay? Um, and, and and then the D, which uh, you show some uh, at some point, is like total um, and some type of demand shifters depending on the location. This will be also in those So, okay. so after uh, kind of a, a lot of um, you know a lot of uh, pain and manipulations, you can actually write this model, even though it's kind of. Um, seems daunting to some extent, you can write as an equilibrium system of two n equations and two n unknowns. Uh, the, the two n equation, two, uh, number n, n, n unknowns wages, and n unknowns, which is the, uh, the, the cost of the intermediate inputs from location i. And this system has um, this characteristic form, this characteristic fixed point that many of these spatial systems have, that um, basically my weights, will depend on all the other wages of other locations in the system um, regulated by a kernel. And this kernel will have, for example, information of the skies as I showed you before, incorporating iceberg costs and fixed costs and so on. So in one, in one way to think about it is that if I trade a lot with locations that are rich or with locations that have very cheap intermediate inputs, that will make me efficient and will make me richer. Of course, all this information again, is incorporating the entire network structure of the model. Um, um, yeah, and then the key thing is that these parameters k are a function of exogenous parameters 
including bilateral trade frictions and the extensive and intensive margin as I showed you before, incorporating the extensive and intensive margin resistance terms to the guys. Um, one other thing is like in most of the places in the model, what matters is that the, the lambda tilde, which is the lambda s, this is the, the, the returns to search intensity for the suppliers divided by the cost, the curvature of the cost for the suppliers at the firm level. The same for the buyers. Uh, the, what matters is lambda tilde, the ratio of the um, search efficiency, lambda b, and the gamma b, which is the search cost uh, curvature. Um, now, a very neat particular feature of this model is that if you take the limit of these two uh, of these two ratios, both of them to zero, then this model collapses to the exogenous search model. Basically, search is so efficient that everyone is a, everyone searches uh, at the maximum level, and the, the the network is exogenous, right? So there is no point. There is no endogeneity just because. Uh, is as if everyone searches everyone and everyone meets everyone. Um, this turns out to be the standard, um, the standard um, setup in the mod, in the, the standard uh, setup uh, that we of exogenous networks that we have in the literature. So uh, starting with Don Cortum, variations of uh, Caliendo and Paro, uh, and so on and so forth. And thus provides a benchmark for us that we can compare our results to the previous literature. To understand now the normative implications of the model. Oh, by the way, sorry, one, one thing I forgot. Yeah, so, um, and we can actually prove that the system has a unique equilibrium so long that these lambda tildes are not too large. Uh, if the returns to, uh, to matching and search and matching are not too strong, then the model will have uniqueness. Otherwise, if they're too strong, you have, you have multiple equilibria because of the search externalities. Um, Going to the normative uh, predictions of the model, we have the following proposition that allows us to again compare to the benchmark uh, or, or the benchmark uh, the exogenous network. We have that the, a, a given shock in the iceberg cost, the, in trade cost between any locations, the, the effect of that shock to welfare depends on the technology effect where XIJ is the mark weights, is like the spending, total spending of the world. Uh, from that region summed up across origin destinations and an endogenous network effect that will tell you how the change in tau induce change in the extensive margin of matching. So the more of this you have, of course, the more, the more matching is created because of the shock, the bigger the welfare gains will be. And indeed, the previous exogenous network models only have this technology effect. So anything that comes as an endogenous network effect will actually boost welfare gains or of course decrease welfare gains uh, depending on the type of intervention compared to an exogenous uh, network model that was the representative in the previous literature. And we have extensions, we extend this model with sectors, population mobility, we have other micro foundations alternative to ours. And I think without further ado, I'm going to spend my last seven minutes to kind of discuss um, how we apply this model to data. And um, of course, as long as no Chilean gets upset that I flipped the uh, country so they can fit it, um, this is Chile. And this is kind of uh, the actual production network we have through Chile, where the bubbles is the population uh, size. And the color from red to, to blue is how much trading there is between municipalities in Chile. Um, this, um, do I have 10 more minutes, five for questions, or only a few minutes? Five minutes, and then uh, another five minutes for the questions. Okay, yeah, so I, I, I can try. Right. Okay, good, good. So this is basically the information we will put into the model. And in suffice it to say, we can, if we have this information, that's all we need to do counterfactuals in our model using some of the techniques in spatial economics. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so I'm going to take this as given. Um, then uh, we, 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 are, we use this um, 345 municipalities data we have. We also use data from foreign countries. Um, we exactly match these bilateral trade flows, the one I showed you, for both within Chile and Chile to the world. 
we assume a labor share in production of 20%. And we estimate the, the structural parameters, the lambda tildes and the sigma, using this fact three that I showed you, which is how much firms respond to positive foreign shocks of uh, cost shocks. So China grows, you become more productive. How many more firms do you reach domestic? Um, and we impose the sufficient conditions for equilibrium uniqueness um, for our estimation. We decompose the bilateral trade frictions into search and matching frictions and iceberg cost. And indeed, we can, uh, in our model, uh, we can kind of separate the two. We can separate the intensive margin friction and the extensive margin friction. And I'm going to show you how this works in the data. Um, I'm going to skip the model, but uh, we actually have a pretty good fit, though we are changing the estimation. We have a pretty good fit to the, to the uh, fact three that I mentioned. So this is a picture of the estimates of iceberg uh, and such a massive friction. So this is, we, we estimate uh, the iceberg cost friction between any two municipalities. Um, and then um, we plot them. Uh, th so this is the density on the x-axis, the probability in the x-axis, and the, sorry, the y-axis, and the x-axis, the magnitude of the, of the friction. And what you see is that in fact, the iceberg cost frictions are basically much smaller, but somewhat a bit more dispersed than the search friction. So the search friction, which were like kind of largely ignored in the literature, though there are some uh, recent papers that now estimate them, uh, including, of course, ours, um, turns out to be bigger than the traditional iceberg cost frictions that people have been using to estimate the kind of the cost of uh, Moving, moving goods across space. Um, so we're going to have two, two counterfactual scenarios for we, based on this data and this calibration we do. The one is in the national trade scenario, where we will look at a change in the trade cost and the domestic implications in Chile. And the second is the domestic transportation infrastructure, where we will simulate the, the building of the, which is under construction or almost done, of the biggest bridge in Latin America that connects the biggest island in Latin America to the mainland of Chile, yeah, the Chilo Chiloe Island mega bridge. And we will see the welfare implications and how these welfare implications kind of space out across Chile. Uh, we'll use our baseline, but we'll also do the extensive margin, uh, no extensive margin model, which is the benchmark in the literature. And remember our model, if you assume the same sigma between our model and the non-endogenous network benchmark, our model will have more response in trade because of the extensive margin response. So, um, so that's kind of, we have to recalibrate our model sometimes to compare with the benchmark. So our model has a bigger response of trade, all else equal, but we have to recalibrate sigma to create the same response. So this is, uh, this, is uh, this is the first kind of factual. It's a 10% reduction in iceberg trade cost from, from Chile and to Chile from different locations, from China, Germany, and USA. And in our baseline model, the one we calibrated with, with the endogenous network, we get that the 10% reduction in iceberg cost with China creates a 1.53% grow and uh, welfare gains for Chile. And that's much bigger, of course, for the corresponding change with Germany because China has already very big relationship with Chile, as is also US. So like with a bigger trading partner, you get bigger gains. The gains are bigger versus uh, variations of the no extensive margin model. In fact, the gains are bigger, even though in this variation of the no extensive margin model, the changes in trade flows are the, are, are the same as our, our baseline uh, because we have sigma five in the in extensive margin that increases the elasticity of trade. While in the baseline we have sigma three, but we have a higher endogenous response of trade, as I mentioned. But they all, between these two versions, the trade flows are basically responding the same way. And our model has bigger welfare implications because of this term I showed you before. Um, that creates an endogenous network effect. Okay, so that keep, gives an additional kick to the welfare gains from openness. Um, and then the, the last kind of function I'm going to close to that, I think hopefully right in time, is the, the planned opening that is going to happen very soon of the largest suspension bridge in South America um, 
which that will shorten the travel times to the mainland from 35 minutes that's currently to just two minutes. So we basically measure the trade cost within Chile for the municipalities and we make our model fit that. And then we make the change from the current to the counter, to the counterfactual, which will be factual soon, of course, the mega bridge. And we simulate the change in the trade cost, um, um, the trade cost because of that. And what we find is that there is a gain of 0.20% um, as a result of this, uh, which is kind of pretty big if you think this is one construction uh, uh, construction inside Chile. But what is very interest, interesting is that um, there are very different direct and indirect effects across municipalities. The municipalities that are trading a lot with the Chile island will get a huge boost in their wealth because now they can trade very, very much more efficiently. They don't have to put in the boats, pay much more money for the shipment, but they, they will have kind of direct access. And then there are both direct effects and indirect effects from this experiment, meaning that the spillovers also spill over, spill over across space. That's the indirect effect. Municipalities that are further away from the Chiloela Island have smaller gains, but they have some are benefited through the spatial uh, effects as a result. Okay, so that was it. Um, I think hopefully right on time. So what do we do? And this, we are still working on the paper to wrap it up. So we'll be changing calibration and so on. But in principle, we analyze the organization of endogenous production networks in, in space um, by using a micro-funded model and we use this rich, rich Chilean data to discipline the micro and, and, and kind of investigate the macro implications. Okay, and thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Costa, for, for this eloquent uh, presentation. Uh, so let me open the floor to, to questions.